with the Napoleon film now in, out in the cinemas. It's been out for a, more than a week here in the UK and getting various reactions and all sorts of talk and debate about its historical accuracy, the liberties it takes with the facts, all this sort of thing, um, and all sorts of other things. With anything like a, a film just the same as a novel in particular, but indeed any book, there's an element where it's entirely subjective and you, you like something or you don't like it and something that someone else, a friend, will tell you is marvellous, you must see this, Sometimes you click and you think, oh yeah, that is good, but other times you just don't see it. Now you have to accept that it's, it's clearly a successful piece of work because it reaches lots of people. It just doesn't speak to you in a particular way or doesn't work for you. Now, in the main, I'm not wanting in these videos to talk about my views on this, that and the other. My belief is that a good historian ought to be as anonymous as possible. You can't remove all of your prejudices, though you might try, but you should do your very best so that someone reading a book has little or no idea about your politics, beliefs, lifestyle, all these sorts of things, because that's not what's important. You should be trying to adopt almost a scientific method where you are taking the evidence and you are presenting it and you're saying, well, this is how scholars try to understand it. This is my particular take, but making abundantly clear this is my opinion, this is guesswork, this is conjecture, these are the large gaps in the sources where we can't prove it either way, or these are the situations where people can look at exactly the same evidence and interpret it differently. differently. Now, obviously, I've written novels about set in the Napoleonic era, although Napoleon himself only figures, I think, in Beat the Drum Slowly, um, very briefly, because that was the time when he was actually in Spain. And even then, he didn't come into direct contact very much with the British because he was called away for other things before that, and most of his time was spent against uh, operating against the much larger and more significant Spanish forces that were deployed against him in that year. So I went to see the film and I enjoyed it. I'm a historian by training. It's been my obsession for all these years. So I must confess, I like watching films. When I go to see a historical film, I tend to try and go in with the lowest possible expectations regarding accuracy, regarding feel for the period, so that I can be pleasantly surprised. When I was a small boy, I would go through the epics on films, say, oh, that piece of armor's wrong, that helmet's wrong, they wouldn't do that, they wouldn't do this. And when you're 12, that gives you great satisfaction. Later in life, I have to think, well, it's nice that somebody has made a film set in an era that I'm interested in. Um, you know, historical films, they're more expensive than many others, they are major enterprises in terms of costume sets, all this sort of thing, and they've got to explain and tell a story to an audience that may not be familiar with it. The one thing we always have to remember is that films like that are not made for the history buff. They're not made for us. Um, they're certainly not made for me. I would like that to be the case. When I write a novel, I have the advantage that I can write a story that I would like to read. And that's really the basis of all that I do, is that I'm writing something where, yes, I've trying to explain things to someone who hasn't spent decades studying the Roman world um, and the Roman army and all of these things, but that the historical accuracy is good. And I have a rather a low threshold for um, tolerance when it comes to, or sorry, rather a high threshold for tolerance when it comes to reading historical fiction. So I will go and see a film that's not too accurate and I'll put up with it because at least it's a film. However, if I'm reading a novel set in the past, then small things will bother me. And I'm, I'm a very poor audience for anything set in the ancient world because the little things that won't bother, bother the overwhelming majority of readers really jump out at me and scream, no, this is not right. The author, you know, he, he or she, they don't know the period as well as I do. Um, and therefore, if they're, if they're more knowledgeable than me, great, then that's convincing or at least as equal. But there are, there are little things where I look at something and say, well, in Roman society, that wouldn't happen, or that detail's wrong, or they've changed this. And it varies on the author, but it doesn't mean that those books aren't perfectly good novels that plenty of other people will read. It's just they're not for me. So as I say, when I go to see a film, I've managed to adapt to the stage where I'm not expecting the history to be that great and can just enjoy those bits that are. Um, so that it, it means I'm coming with a different approach, I'm less critical, and I'm, I'm more tolerant because I like to see. When you get, if you come away from a movie and there are a few scenes that you thought, oh yeah, that really looked good, or yeah, maybe that was about right, sometimes even, it can make you think, well, I wonder if it was like that. So with Napoleon, I wasn't expecting it to be 
a documentary and it wasn't meant to be a documentary. Now I've worked on drama documentaries, several of them, some of them were at fairly small budget, some of them pretty big budget and quite ambitious where you have a full cast that speak, where you have reasonable numbers of extras, um, sets and these days as well CGI adding in. So the, um, the History Channel series on ancient empires, I think they've called it in the end, it was originally Titans of the Ancient World, um, that have just been on recently. You know, there's some pretty good scenes, particularly considering the fact these don't have a blockbuster movie budget and they don't have the time and they don't have the resources to do that, yet they've done some good things. There are other bits where they've had to compromise with what was available and produce something that's as good as they could make it or that they feel is simpler for the audience to understand. But their aim is to be much closer to the history than a straightforward movie that is you know, a novel on film. It's, it's fiction. It's meant to be from the start. Documentary makers are doing something different and even they have to make compromises because of what's practical, but also one of the big problems, and this is a problem that the film Napoleon faces, but so do many others, is that it's very hard to deal with complicated events that occur over a long period of time when you can't assume the audience has any prior knowledge at all. So someone who's come in completely fresh and has never heard of Alexander the Great if it's about him or Napoleon can sit there and not be lost, have some idea of what's happening, who's who, what's going on, what's the importance of all of this. Which does mean that you've got to start from that level and that assumption and not try and please the person who is, is really keen and knows a lot because they've read a lot and studied a lot and you know, are knowledgeable and all the different grades within that. You know, some of us, we're quite interested in a particular period, but it might not be our main thing, but we know enough to think, oh, that's wrong, that looks dodgy. But when you're trying to cover, in the Napoleon film, they're covering more than 20 years. You know, they're going from 1793 up to, well, past 1815. And you have the same actor, best will in the world, you're not going to be able to age people that effectively. Um, so you're essentially relying on the character as this is how he'll develop, it's going to be played by the same person. And you have to explain an awful lot. And that's true if you look at the Oliver Stone, Alexander the Great movie is, is very similar. It's a biopic. You're trying to tell the story of Alexander. You're trying to explain about Alexander the Great to people who know about him and are keen, who've heard of him and those who you know, know nothing at all. And that's Alexander who had a much shorter career, but he did pack rather a lot into it. Um, I've had this time and again when I've worked on several documentaries and drama documentaries about Hannibal. And it's true even when you're writing on the subject, one of the great epics, one of the things everybody knows about Hannibal is taking elephants over the Alps. And when you look in more detail, as obviously the researchers will do as they're preparing these things, it's very easy to get taken up with that journey from Spain through Gaul, over the Alps, into Italy, because that's an epic in itself. But in terms of historical importance, all that achieved was to allow Hannibal to start his real war fighting the Romans. But you can easily find that a third of your screen time has got caught up with all the incidents of, you know, ferrying elephants across the River Rhone, ambushes in the Alps, all of these things before you finally arrive ragged, tired. Lots of you have struggled, lots of you have died en route, but you've got there and you're in Italy. And the ancient sources are quite detailed on this, but that, that there is a tendency that you focus on that. And you're also, of course, at that stage trying to set things up, who Hannibal is, who the Romans are, what's going on. But suddenly you then have the big battles. So obviously, can I deserves to have a major place, but the others are interesting. The ambush of Flaminius, you know, at Lake Trasimene, in the fog, all very dramatic, great stuff. Fog is a wonderful thing because it can conceal the limits of your number of extras. And you can make, you know, that's one of those battles that does break down into little segments that are, are easier to film without the mass um, effects and the, the extras and the props and all that sort of thing, all the CGI work post-production. Those are all great stories and you are drawn towards those and you desperately want to include them. And then you get to Canine. If you're going to do that in a way that is intelligible, as I, I think we managed with the, the BBC Hannibal um, all those years ago, you simplify that, but you still allow it to occupy a fair bit of screen time because it is dramatic. It is, you know, one of the worst slaughters in human history before the industrial era. Um, and it shows Hannibal's cleverness, how he can take a stronger opponent and defeat them. But when you've told that story, 
you've probably again wasted, or not wasted, but spent the bulk of your screen time. Now Hannibal is still in Italy for a decade and you've still got Zama to deal with afterwards, you've got all the things that are happening elsewhere. So there's a great tendency, there are highlights in somebody's career that you're drawn towards and they make great stories and they're visually very strong and they also have the advantage that for your audience that knows a little, they're probably going to recognize and expect these things. But you're unlikely, you can't cover all of Hannibal's battles, you can't cover all of Alexander's battles, you certainly can't cover all of Napoleon's battles. And there is an element where you're having to present a story that is intelligible. So if you don't have a lot of time and resources, you can't set up to say, well, this is where this army is, this is its composition, this is the topography, this is how Hannibal outwits the Romans at Cannae. Obviously, the, the Ridley Scott Napoleon film is a very impressionistic view of the battles. They're meant to be spectacular, dramatic, but essentially simple. So you have, um, well, to do too many spoilers, but uh, Austerlitz is largely about the ice and the surprise, and it doesn't reflect the the battle itself. And I, I feel confident in saying that, even though I wasn't at Austerlitz, but all the sources suggest that it's a rather more complex story. But that's a complex story that it would be extremely difficult to tell in the course of a film that isn't primarily about Napoleon's battles, but is about the relationship with Josephine. So you can understand why they go that way, even though you'd love to have from the history buff's point of view, I'd like to have, look, he's got all those extras, got all that resources. Couldn't you have you know, mentioned the Prats and Heights, given some sense of how Napoleon fools the allies into attacking on his right and then hits them hard. Um, but that needs to be explained, all of which takes time and space. And in the end, I think a lot of people will remember that scene of the, um, the Austrian standard bearer galloping away from the cracking ice may not have much to do with history, but it's very powerful. It's, it's cinema, it's a really good image. You know, you do feel for the poor devil who's trying to escape. And the Waterloo scenes, you know, you do get redcoats in squares and French cavalry attacking around. So you've got that one element of Waterloo, but there clearly isn't space in the story for La Haye de Saint or Hougoumont or, you know, a battle that lasts all day and involves on the three sides involved, you know, you're pushing 150, 200,000 men all in their units, all doing different things. This is very complicated. In the movie Waterloo, you know, which is devoted to that and spends about an hour of screen time on that, it is still greatly simplified. So there are gradations in some movies are trying to do different things and also these are choices of the production side, what's important to them. Now, I personally always get annoyed when somebody changes something drastically, invents something that's actually duller less exciting, less interesting than the real history. That tends to happen a lot. Sometimes that's simply because the writers just think it's a great idea. But again, on these topics, I've usually spent a lot more time thinking about it. So again, the things that matter to me, maybe there'll be someone who knows nothing will think, wow, that was great. I suppose the idea in Napoleon was to show his cleverness, how he outwits his enemies. And that's the, the way Austerlitz is depicted, even if it's in a very simplified form that isn't really about the grand tactics or um, of the battle itself and its context. You know, you hear nothing about all, all of these sorts of things. But again, how are you going to fit that in into, it's a longish film already, but there isn't time and space to do everything in great detail. Same when you're dealing with Hannibal, the same when you're dealing with Alexander. You know, in the, the Oliver Stone film, you've got Gaugamela is done quite impressively. And yes, there's some license, but nevertheless, it's, it's you know, you're, you're looking at this and thinking as nature story, actually, that's not bad. That looks pretty good. That gives you a sense of the scale, the numbers, the dust, all of these things. And you know, the, the battle scenes are visually impressive in Napoleon. There's a lot of extras, presumably supplemented by CGI soldiers. The uniforms, you know, they're not bad. Um, one criticism I would have, and this seems to be a trend of a lot of modern films, is that they're quite cloudy. Most of the scenes seem to occur on dull days. Now that may reflect when and where they film, but that's something of a shame when you have all these bright and colorful uniforms that really would spring to life in a, in a brighter setting. You know, perhaps I'm, I'm a um, traditionalist at heart and the old fashioned Technicolor still appeals. That was a bit, but that's a, that's a minor thing. Um, but I mean, that was, if you look at The Last Duel, um, which is a, a film that bears watching more than once because it improves each time you see it when you notice the little details. Again, 
14th century France is basically cloudy and looks rather cold. Now, I'm sure on a lot of occasions it was, but you'd, you'd like a bit of sunshine, a bit of brightness sometimes, um, just for the, the colours. But again, that may be a choice, the sense of the mood they want. I think a lot of it has to do with the way film is edited now because it's, it's digital as well. There's much more manipulation, um, the same as so many films are obsessed with having things taking place in darkness, so it's very difficult to know what's going on. Now, I don't mind that when you're suggesting the candlelight and the, the, the sort of lighting they would have indoors in the late 18th, early 19th century or in the, the medieval period, um, but outdoors. It's, it's rather like that oddity whereby ever since Saving Private Ryan, the Second World War has largely become faded and muted colours. You know, to, the, the stated aim then was it was to look like newsreel footage, colour film that had been taken but had obviously suffered in the processing and this sort of thing, which is fine, it's just that's not what people at the time were seeing. And you do have a big problem in that these mediums have to be visual, you have to try and show what's happening, make it look as impressive as possible. Um, you know, I for one am greatly looking forward to the is it Masters of the Air, the, the Apple series based on the book about the 8th Air Force. And it, the book is very good. It's come from the, the same stable that produced Band of Brothers and Pacific, which had its moments but sort of lost the thread of the, the plot a bit. I've only seen the advert so far. It will be interesting to see how they present the mass bomber formations, the fighter attacks, this sort of thing. Um, it's very hard to beat the 1969 film, The Battle of Britain, which relied overwhelmingly on real aircraft. Not all of them 100% accurate for 1940, but close enough, you know, if they were later model Spitfires, if they were uh, Spanish modified um, 109s, at least they look pretty good. And with the Battle of Britain film, it was interesting, I was just reading a book about the making of the film and where they found the aircraft and all that sort of thing you get that sense of real aircraft being flown by real people. So the formations are never quite so perfect. You've got aircraft bobbing up and down in the slipstream of others, trying to adjust this sort of thing. There is often a tendency with CGI to make things too neat. They look, they don't look as if they're being flown or driven if they're vehicles by actual people who are all slightly different in, like any piece of machinery, they're all again, slightly different in performance. You know that from, you can get in the same model of car as your own, but it's not quite the same if somebody else has been driving it for a while. It's just even coming off a mass production line, things aren't absolutely identical as a rule. But it was interesting, even in the Battle of Britain, they made the aircraft close up much more. So for instance, quite a lot you see the Schwarm, the uh, Finger Four as the Allies called it, with four um, German Messerschmitt 109s, um, and they've made them much closer. In real life, that was spread out over a wide area because the whole point was you had a leader and wingman and another leader and wingman, and they'd worked together. They were watching each other's tails. They were searching the sky. It was to give them lots of space. They weren't worrying about, am I going to bump into the person next to me? They were looking for the enemy. But if you did that on camera, you wouldn't see all four of them very often, or they'd be very small. So they made things like that smaller and tighter. And I suspect there will be a similar things. If you look at the newsreel footage of... 8th Air Force formations, they do, yes, they're close, but they're probably not quite as close as they're going to be represented in movies because if, if you let them be as they really were, they do spread out over miles and miles. You know, these are huge formations, these mass bomber formations that would develop. And similarly, when your fighters come in, when you look at you know, the combat footage in uh, things like the documentary film, The Memphis Bell, the speed of it all, the confusion of it all, and these tiny specks are suddenly upon you, then they're past. And they're fairly spread out because, again, they don't want to collide with each other and they don't want to be bounced by the enemy. So you have moments in films like The Battle of Britain is, broadly speaking, pretty good. You know, it tells the basics of the story. There are liberties, there are things they change, there are scenes they invent, there are exaggerated things, there are limits to the types of aircraft because they had available. Um, but it's not bad. It's not 100% accurate, it's not a documentary, but you could come away from that knowing a reasonable amount about something if you'd known nothing before that would be you know, not bad. Um, and there are historical films like that that do that job, but they're setting out to do something else to a, a biopic of a Napoleon that isn't really even that. It's more about his relationship with, with Josephine and how that developed. You know, you don't really get Napoleon's other affairs. You don't get Maria Wallace and all that sort of thing. Um, 
So there are always these problems with any film. If you tried to make, every now and again, people talk about making a film about Julius Caesar. I'd love to see it. There have been attempts with miniseries and the like, but again, you've got somebody whose career is very long, who does an awful lot. And you could look at the HBO um, Rome series that you know, covered Caesars around for the first season. Even that only deals with the last few years of his life. And even that jumps over lots of things. It also decides to go off its own way into more soap opery elements. Again, that's fine if that's what they want to do. Um, sometimes, again, I think they invented things that were less interesting than the real history and perhaps less dramatic as well. But um, you know, that's the way things work. And these stories will develop. Various people will chip in. They will see what they've got, resources, cast-wise, who can be where, who can do what, and things will develop. And it is all about making it intelligible. Now, um, I've helped in a very small way on a couple of, of dramas in terms of trying to think of how the battle should be shown and how they should have a story that makes sense in The Last Kingdom in a couple of the episodes and then for the Brunenberg scenes in the Seven Kings Must Die film. That's again an interesting parallel when you think up until then you had a series of 10 or so episodes would cover two novels and then they had to take the story of a single novel but they had to pack it down to less than two hours which just means you're rushing and that's another thing I felt with Napoleon um, is that it it feels a bit rushed you know it's trying to cover so much and jumping on that there's not always time for everybody the characters to breathe for you to take in it's also quite difficult to work out who some of the people are I mean I, I came to the conclusion that the chap with the moustache is Marshal Ney at during the Waterloo scenes I think that's right but I wasn't sure now again it doesn't stop you from enjoying the film but Perhaps because I'm looking for, oh, I wonder how they're going to show this. I wonder how they're going to depict that person. You're looking out, you want to know more. So again, maybe that's the reaction of the historian coming to it rather than um, somebody who knows nothing in the first place or very little, or, you know, sort of not tonight, Josephine is about all they know about Napoleon. So it's that difficulty of covering a lot in a small time, in a you know, limited time and making the story intelligible but also moving beyond narrative so that there's some sense of you know the emotional journeys of the characters so we've got to deal with that so it's quite difficult you've got to present things that make sense people have got to feel that they've come in they don't know anything about Austerlitz they maybe don't know anything much about Waterloo they could look at those scenes and they have a rough idea of okay that's what the film's telling me is why the French won the first one and they lost the second one and it looks impressive and it looks spectacular. I've seen all these colorful uniforms and these smoke and these cannon and all this sort of thing. Wow, isn't that great? It's never likely to be you know, anything like 100% accurate or even perhaps more than 50% accurate. In the end, it's very difficult to know. All we have are, when you go back to battles that far um, in the past, you've got descriptions, you've got um, paintings, drawings, that sort of thing, but you don't have the relatively limited combat footage. You know, there's, there's relatively little from the Second World War that shows actual combat rather than before or after, or the background to it, or, you know, an artillery um, detachment letting off and loading and firing again. Because obviously it's pretty dangerous to be in the middle of a battle and filming. And, you know, it's a striking thing if you represented modern 20th century and, and afterwards warfare accurately, you probably wouldn't see the enemy at all most of the time other than until you've occupied the position and you're seeing their casualties their prisoners that's the, the ones you've taken that sort of thing um you know i noticed this even the little bit of soldiering i did on exercise with the otc at oxford even just you know you're, you're on exercise you're supposedly coming under effective enemy fire you take cover L going prone in long grass suddenly you can see very little indeed and anyway just that difference in height makes a huge difference on what you can see and that's even without people really shooting at you and the importance of taking cover being more significant you add in long grass wheat fields that sort of thing it's even harder to know um it's a slightly confusing film but the the uh, manic movie the thin red line in their attack on, up that ridge in the the long grass gives a good idea of just how confusing things are and how little you can actually see and know what's going on. So you can do it, but you can't do it too much, otherwise the audience is just confused. Now, obviously, a movie like this, it's not, the Napoleon is not focused on these particular battles. They are scenes within it. They are sort of waypoints within the story. They're dramatic. It's, 
it's meant to be spectacular. They can't quite match the spectacle of the old Waterloo movie or the um, the War and Peace, the Russian version that was a few years before. But then, you know, how many directors have a couple of divisions of the Soviet Army as their extras and the time and the space and can do that? And even those, you still haven't got the numbers of the real thing. You don't have as much smoke as in the real thing. You don't have all the chaos confusion. You know, most personal accounts of battle have the, the individual give very little sense of what's going on beyond their immediate area and their, their memories and their sense of time may also be confused because obviously they've had a lot to think about. So representing that, you can do it the impressionistic way, but there is a tendency to go back to the familiar symbolism and language of film. So, you know, at Waterloo, everybody piles in. There's a big bayonet fighter scrummage that could have come from Gladiator as, as easily as a film set in 18, or a scene set in 1815. It's not the reality of, of war in that period. It's probably not the reality of warfare in the second century AD for Gladiator either, but it's very impressive cinema and it's something the audience understand. These men are fighting a desperate battle. It's really dangerous. It's really unpleasant. It's really confusing. So in other videos, we might look at some other Rome, mostly Roman films and try and understand them and what they're doing and what they, what they do well is quite nice, as well as we'll talk a little bit about the things that, okay, this is just invention, this doesn't work, but they're not going to be criticism of, from a nerdy way, oh, well, this is wrong and he should not have had that helmet or this happened a month later in just for the sake of it. You know, anyone can prove that they're smarter or they know more than these people who've actually gone out and made something. But again, that's not really very productive. Um, hopefully, I always hope the next historical film is going to be fairly accurate, and some of them are, and some of them in, employ more license, do a different thing. I think there's going to be a longer version of Napoleon, um, probably on Apple or something like that, that I think would be worth a look. I would be interested to see, because, um, for instance, the um, Kingdom of Heaven, the, the Crusades film that Ridley Scott did a few years ago, if you ever watch the longer director's cut, it's a much better film. It just makes more sense. The characters breathe a bit more. There's a bit more background. Things are explained as to why they do things. It's still a pinch of salt as regards history. But so, I think there's going to be a, a longer version of Napoleon, and it will be interesting to see whether you get more sense of the, uh, the personality of his family, of particularly the marshals, you know, is that nay? Do we ever see Murat? Uh, people like that. The, there is room. You'd like to think that one day, if ever there was the budget, somebody could do a great TV series, miniseries sort of thing about Napoleon, his marshals, their families. In that context of that incredible roller coaster ride of many of these people from very poor backgrounds, you know, the Messenas, the Nays, the people like that, and their conflicts, because they are, you know, they are larger than life at the time. They don't get on. They argue, they bicker, they're rivals, they're jealous, things go right, things go wrong. That could be lots of fun. All the affairs um, of the, the wives and mistresses, all this sort of thing, ambition for the children, this type of stuff. That would be nice, but that's not what this is trying to do. So it'd be nice to have more sense of that. It would be nice to have some of the time, you know, you basically you jump from Russia to 100 days, pretty much, or the abdication in 100 days. Um, and it's they're just a bit more detail, and even the character development. There are some big leaps in the film as it stands, and I think there's, you know, there's talk of more, more than an hour or so, so it could be a, a very different beast when it comes out that way. I would personally like a little bit more about Napoleon the Soldier. Uh, now, whether that was an interest of the, of the director or not, you don't really get much sense of that incredible relationship he developed with his army in general and particularly the Imperial Guard. You know, there's these blokes around in uniform and sentry duty, but you don't get, there is one bit with a pinching of the cheek, but he's not, you know, it'd be nice to have reviewing a Hussars, Guardsman, infantry line or whatever, that talking to a soldier, I remember you from Austerlitz, I remember you from Marengo, this sort of thing, we were there, that was a day. That sense of how he persuaded so many men to do these exceptional things and take these appalling losses. And the element, the, the cynicism behind it, you know, there was genuine affection, but also he was quite willing to waste their lives as well if it achieved what he wanted to achieve. So the complexity of Napoleon, you get a sort of glimpse of it near the end where he's talking to those Navy midshipmen um, on the Belofra, as it's supposed to be. I think it's HMS Warrior by the look of it um, down. So it's, you know, again, okay, not the right warship. That's a later period, um, iron-hulled rather than, but I suspect that's, 
it, it helps with the light, but it's probably also, I think there's been renovation work on the Victory, so they probably couldn't use that, or maybe they just couldn't get permission. And it is always more interesting filming on a location rather than a set, however good a set is. So it would be nice to have more, it would be nice if it makes more sense. I think in the end, we, we've got to come back to this. The odds are that anyone will go out and make a movie that's perfect for Adrian Goldsworthy is, is, is pretty slim. I think that's, I, I've waited a long time. I don't think this is going to happen, but there are quite a few that I really like and I think are pretty good historically or not bad anyway. Good enough where you think, yeah, they've made an effort, they've tried. Others have done other things that could be very good films, even if historically it's more than a bit iffy. But I remember watching things like Spartacus, Ben-Hur, all this sort of thing, helped to get me interested. And I've mentioned in one of the videos about the novels, one of the reasons I became interested in the Duke of Wellington's army and the Napoleonic era was that somebody gave me a copy of um, a book, The Armies of Waterloo, which was based on the uniform research for the movie Waterloo, with all these wonderful illustrations in of all these incredibly colorful uniforms. That led to decades of, as a hobby, reading, finding out everything I could about this era, about the soldiers, discovering all these, these wonderful memoirs, personal accounts, to writing those novels, you know, and still having an ongoing interest and hoping to get back to those novels one day and do other things set in that era. So even, you know, something like this, which is not set out as a documentary history lesson on Mrs. Napoleon, but is more about personality and the relationship and the sort of destructive um, bond that these two people have in the director's and point of view and how the actors choose to represent it. And I think that all, you know, it works. It is powerful. You do come out thinking this, well, that was interesting. And um, even if part of you is saying, yeah, I'm not quite sure. Did that happen then? Or did that really happen at all? And then all this debate about the respective ages. But again, you can't have someone who's changes enough to reflect Napoleon at all stages of his life. <sighs> yes, the, you know, Joaquin Phoenix is older than Napoleon was. Uh, for most of it, Vanessa Kirby is younger than Josephine was, but they seem to, it seems to work. You know, I thought it was good. I thought it was interesting. I look forward to the, the longer version. Um, again, whether that will, I'll come away thinking, oh yeah, that was much better, or whether, no, actually that's a bit long and laborious. Who knows until you see it. Um, but if you are interested in history, go in not expecting a documentary, not expecting absolute faith or even close to it. And I think you'll enjoy it. It's, it's a good film. It's an impressive film. And there are scenes where you have, you know, the whiff of grape shot, where you have um, some of the parades, some of the army on coming, some of those moments. It gives that sense of the spectacle of the grandeur of it all and the horror of it all. Um, I was expecting it to be rather more brutal in terms of its reflection of wounds and that sort of thing than it, it actually is. It's not that gruesome. Um, and again, that's, you know, that's, that's how they wanted to go. Um, and in the end, sometimes if it's too gruesome, that can, can put you off, can leave a sour taste, even though you know that that's, you know, round shot is going to knock off heads, knock off limbs, um, canister is going to rip people up, you know, being shot by a musket ball isn't fun. All of these things are very unpleasant. Um, so, you know, it's there. Same way I look forward to Gladiator 2, whatever name that gives. The first one was a lot of fun. It gets some things right. Its basis of history is loose. It has a lot more to do with influences from other TV series like I, Claudius and uh, movies and you know that perception, the idea people want to form a republic in the late second century AD, not terribly likely. Commodus lasts, what, about an hour and a half, two hours in the film instead of 12 years. But again, it's a film. It's telling a story. There are elements where the sense of gladiators as entertainment as spectacle, as, you know, a bit of the Hollywood touch is marvellous and hasn't always come through in other films, even if, you know, maybe it exaggerates and I think, uh, but nevertheless, it's, it gives a sense of that's what it's for. It's for the crowd to look at, wow, isn't this spectacular? Isn't this brutal? All of this sort of thing. Um, it'll be interesting to see what story they, they choose and what, what's involved in the second one. And at the very least, as I said before, it gets people interested. You know, we're already history buffs, we're already keen, but we'll get more books written, we'll get more films made, we'll get more documentaries made if there are more of us. The more there are, the bigger the market is, the more they'll be drawn. And over time, some of those will please us more than others, but you've got to get all of them to get those ones that you think are really good. And at other times, you just have to switch off the historian in you and just enjoy it as a story and think of it. As I say, I'm... 
I'm happier to do that with a film than I am with a novel. I, I, I'm afraid I'm touchy and I, I'm not quite to the extreme of Napoleon of you know, throwing a book he doesn't like out of the, the carriage window because he's bored within a few pages. I, I just won't go on. I've got to the point, whereas when I was younger, I felt that I had to finish any book I started because otherwise it was somehow a failure or it was an insult to the author or any, anything crazy like that. I'm afraid middle age means that, no, I can't be bothered. There's only a limited amount of time. I'm going to stick with something I enjoy more. So there are plenty of novels that have a huge audience, are highly successful. They're just not for me. Um, with a film, I'm willing to accept far more liberties if it's a, a good entertaining film. And even just for those few moments where you look at it, I mean, the coronation scene, I think is very good in the Napoleon film. It, it reminds me of, and there are some others that you feel the inspiration has been a painting and it, it brings that type of the, the one of Napoleon looking at the Sphinx. Um, you know, again, the Egyptian campaign is rushed through all very quickly, not really explained, you know, and you don't hear about what happened afterwards in the Battle of the Nile and all this sort of thing, but you don't have time for that sort of thing. So it's highly impressionistic. It takes lots of liberties, but it's an interesting take. And how many films are there set in that era? So, you know, we've got to accept what we're given and what we're offered and enjoy it for the sake of at least we're getting something that comes to a period or a topic that um, we take an interest in rather than simply saying, well, it's not 100% accurate. They haven't bothered. They've changed this. They've changed that. Right. Not not interested. I'm not going to see that. Again, your choice if that's what you want to do. But I I think, as I say, the the more the better, because in time you'll get those films where it's much more about the purpose is more about, well, let's try and tell the story of this battle, of this campaign, of um, this leader in more detail about them as a politician, as a military commander, as whatever it might be. So all of those things will only happen if studios are willing to take the punt on the very expensive risk of making historical films. So again, I think any time someone makes them even if there are bits that make us cringe, it's well worth having it there because it helps. It's, there will be, there's usually something good in them. Um, not always, but there's usually something that you can take away and think, oh yeah, I like that, that wasn't bad. That's all. Or even if it's just the background, the sense that, okay, yeah, you know, there's, there's extras there, the uniforms, they're not too bad, that's nice to see, or that's, you know, some sense of numbers. Um, so it's all there, it's all worth having. So. I, as I say, I enjoyed the film. Um, I'll, I look forward to watching the longer version when that comes out. And I dare say I'll watch the ordinary cinema version as well again sometime because films like that, you miss things. You know, there's lots of little details that don't always stand out, but it's something that's worth seeing on the big screen because of the spectacle you get in some of the, the scenes. And I'm, you know, I, I, again, I'm fond of the old epics. I like that grandeur. I, I feel fortunate that they re-released um, Spartacus so I could see that in the cinema. Um, Lawrence of Arabia as well. Films like that that just, they, they come to even greater life on that big screen. Um, no matter how large your TV is, it's not quite the same, um, even if it's a bit more comfortable. So I'm glad that, I'm glad this film's been made. I'm glad Gladiator 2's being made. Hopefully more historical films will come along. I'm really pleased Masters of the Air is coming out. Hopefully that'll be good. Hopefully it'll look more real than some of the CGI efforts can, that they'll, they will have looked enough, studied enough pictures of real aircraft, film of real aircraft flying. They will have understood how that works to do that. And they won't take too many liberties with the history, but you never know. Um, again, you can't expect something that's going to please all of us, really, all the history buffs all the time, because there's not enough of us to make it economically viable. And it'd be nice to think the directors and everybody else cares enough to make that happen. And some do to a greater or lesser degree, but they've also got to make the film they want to make and they've got to reach a wider audience and try and, or try and work out how to do that, which isn't the easiest thing to judge because throughout history, lots of expensive, lavish films haven't done particularly well and others have succeeded to everybody's surprise. You know, all these um, the superhero films I don't care for very much. They keep churning out. Those are not cheap to make, um, but they don't always do well. And some do, some don't. So let's see. Let's hope. Um, I'm going to, this will be a very occasional series, but the idea is I'm going to look at some TV series, old films, 
mostly Roman ones, but we'll see some others as well thrown in and talk a little bit about the history background and some of the things where there are those nice scenes where you think, oh, that's interesting, or that makes us think, or that's a way of um, thinking about how it might actually have been. So that's the purpose.